Hello and welcome to the Auto Buyer's Guide podcast powered by Alex on Autos. I'm Tim Masso, he's Alex Dykes, and today we are discussing the best horror movie of 2022, which is the saga of Carvana. Alex, <laughs> as we stand today, what is the state of Carvana? We'll backtrack a bit, but where are we now? I guess we're just waiting for them to declare bankruptcy. I think that's really what we're waiting for. It does seem that way. It seemed too good to be true. At the outset of the pandemic, Carvana, an Arizona-based online car retailer, uh, seemed to be in the catbird seat, selling cars the way people wanted to buy them, touchlessly, online, mm -hmm. at a time when basically people had all the time in the world and pandemic savings to buy cars. Yep. Now, they've been public since 2017, and they hit their high watermark for stock price at over 340 in the summer of 2021. Now, never mind that, just in the last year, that, that is basically the calendar year of 2022, their stock is down 97% from about oh, 240 to just under five bucks, which is to say they're perilously close to becoming a penny stock. Mm -hmm. They have rarely made money. They have six billion in debt and their market cap is about five hundred and fifty million dollars. How did we get here? Don't you wish you'd shorted the stock or, or ridden it on the way up? Um, I saw oh I could see the meteoric rise of Carvana. It made sense at the time. And I can also see why now it doesn't make sense anymore. Carvana's always been a bit pricey and their big claim to fame at the run up to the pandemic was People want to buy cars touchlessly. They want to buy them online. They want to have them arrive and unload and not go to that icky dealer with all the COVID running around. And they were willing to pay more for that honor. Now everybody says, well, that's stupid. I'm just going to get the cheapest deal I can find. Car prices are going down. And Carvana is stuck with a lot of inventory. And a lot of inventory they paid a lot for. Um, if anybody remembers some of the reporting we did on Carvana, uh, we sold a Durango to Carvana. We attempted to sell uh, the Mach-E to Carvana, and the amounts they were offering were just bonkers. I mean, they were offering to buy used cars sight unseen from people uh, with a few photos here and there and a self-attestation of, of, uh, of its quality and its condition for about the private party transaction on KBB or above. So absolutely stupid pricing. So it's no wonder that they, they just couldn't make a go of it. The Durango, I think, is a good example. I, my, my memory is exactly uh, or unclear really on exactly how much we sold it for, but I am clear that we looked it up and our Durango was picked up here from San Jose, California. It was shipped to Utah where it was listed for sale in Salt Lake for $1,000 more than they bought it for. Okay, so it gets worse from here. If that sounds bad, consider this. At the same time that they were paying premiums for used cars, because remember, used cars were the surrogate for the new cars we couldn't buy due to pandemic mm -hmm. scarcity. And there was a time in the early part of this year when that market was still riding quite high. So at the same time, it's paying too much to acquire inventory. Carvana is also acquiring Odessa's physical auction business, which is supposed <laughs> to help them better buy and service cars. Uh, but the problem is they took on billions of dollars, $2.2 .2 billion worth of debt to do this right about at the time we started to see the surge of interest rates. So before used car values started falling, there was interest rate hikes. And this is a very interest rate sensitive yep. sector. And they should have known. Yeah. <laughs> They should have, because it was coming from a mile away. Yeah. Um, it's, so they, they, they did an Elon, buy high, bankrupt low. Oh, it gets worse. It gets worse. And this is where it becomes relevant, really, from the consumer side. Because you will notice that they're trying to still sell those cars that they bought dear too high. Their yes. prices are unacceptable. The real problem here is that there's also malfeasance. And this is where they start to lose their dealer licenses in states like Michigan, North Carolina, and Illinois, and open themselves up to class action lawsuits. You may have noticed, regardless of how you bought a used car during the pandemic, that it has become a chore to get your hands on a title. And normally this just involves a lot of waiting. But with Carvana, it often turned out into a wait without a payoff. Mm-hmm. 
And part of this is the way that Carvana was acquiring cars and and not doing their due diligence. They were buying leases out. They were buying uh, t- uh, vehicles that didn't have clear titles yet because there was a lien holder on it. Then theoretically, they paid off the lien, they satisfied the lease, whatever, and then they would sell the car. But oftentimes they were transacting the vehicle before they got the title. Um, yes. And that really added extra drama to it. So everybody's gears are turning slowly. They pay off the lease with, say, Ford Motor Credit. Ford takes, I don't know, 60 days to release the title. Then they have to turn around then and get the title over to the correct state, get it registered, get that title issued, do that. And Carvana was late. So, I mean, it could be months and months and months till you had a clear title. By that time, I mean, the car could have been totaled or you could have just said, hey, screw it. I'm just going to sell it. And it gets worse than that, too, because there are some states where you can't even have an unregistered car sitting in your driveway. So you become liable and it gets worse because Carvana was doing all sorts of things to try to, well, kick the can down the road, like applying for temporary tags in multiple states to keep these clients at bay. In some cases, they were taking a car that was brought in and within the grace period that the client gets to send their Carvana car back and get their trade back, they were taking that traded car that was still within the return period, they were then selling it to another person in another state. So if a person decided to return his Carvana car, get his trade back, he would find that a person in another state now held the title in some cases. Yep. I mean, and it was completely understandable that they were trying to start to play those tricks because the house of cards was starting to fall apart. There just wasn't enough cash going on. I, I kind of blame the surge in in uh, the things that went wrong with Carvana to inappropriately playing the surge that we also saw with CarMax and a, a number of these other uh, retail sites where they're trying to transact pr- uh, used cars in this 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 way because there was a bidding war basically going on for used cars at the beginning. It was all, I could go to, to CarMax and I could get a you know a bid on the car and I could go to Carvana and well, it's, you know, it's not quite as much as the other place and Vroom and whatever else was out there. And it was just absolutely insane. I would not be surprised if Vroom was next. And Carvana is not quite dead yet, but it's important to remember a few things. The biggest piece of the pie is the ownership, because though it's been publicly traded for a little over five years, it's pretty much a dictatorship. Ernie Garcia II owns about 85% of the voting shares, and he and his son, Ernie III, essentially control this house of cards. It is burning through cash at a fearsome pace. And while they could theoretically raise more cash, you draw the trend line and it looks bad. Because for a long time, they did what a lot of upstart businesses did in tech, in fracking and fossil fuels. Um, Go for market share and volume and make profitability a secondary consideration. So it's not like there's a huge um, pile of money from the fat times to tide them over. They're probably looking at three to six months of cash in an extremely cash intensive position. Yeah. And it is interesting that Vroom is uh, positioned a little bit differently because as I recall, AutoNation is their, one of their major investors. So they have perhaps a, a, a partner that they could draw upon or at least you try and get cash from. Um, Shift was another one of those others. I, they were all doing the same thing to a less shady degree than, than Carvana. Yeah. So what we're looking at right now with Carvana is uh, serious questions about whether you'd want to do business with them at all. Uh, there are another there are enough alternatives. So the CarMax is the world. There are CPO programs. And at this point, the only people who should be really interested in Carvana are people who are high risk investors. Everyone mm-hmm. who wants to buy a car at this point, I cannot recommend anyone actually buy a car through Carvana at this point. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, you know, unless they somehow come out with the uh, new offer to give you the title in your hand when they give you the car, that's that's a bit tricky. Yeah, there are huge structural problems in place with state DMVs, um, and those are not going to change. As a result, Carvana's business model is not going to improve. Um, Part of that's not on them. But when you sell someone a car and make a promise to them that it's their car, you need to be able to back it up. You can't just blame the state and palm this off on Illinois or Michigan or Pennsylvania. And here in Pennsylvania, there is a class action lawsuit against them, which may create yet another suck on their funds and their ability to sell cars. So basically just, you know, I I don't know what like the Tinder expression is, but what is it like swipe left or swipe right? Yeah, it's definitely a problem. (laughs)
Okay, now another question, um, yeah, big picture stuff. The problem a lot of people have, and we're going to shift our focus to plug-in hybrid vehicles. A lot of people say that this is a solution whose time has passed it by. But from a mm -hmm. practicality standpoint, this might be the best solution for us right now. Alex, share some of this reasoning with me because you really worked it out long form. Yeah, I, I was intrigued by this question because, uh, of course, we have a long-term EV6 at the moment. I was driving the EV6 GT this same week. We'll talk about that a bit later. And then in for review, we have a Nero plug-in hybrid. And the Nero is probably uh, an interesting uh, test tube case because it's one of the very few vehicles in North America, actually maybe the only one left, that is available as a full EV, a hybrid without a plug, and a hybrid with a plug. So you can get three different forms. And we also have a vehicle that, although not quite related platform-wise within the envelope, is almost exactly the same size and has no hybrid option at all, the Kia Seltos. So when you look at the Seltos, Nero, Nero plug-in hybrid and EV, you have four different flavors of, of engine technology at the moment. And this kind of made me ask the question, in a world where we are relatively limited in terms of manufacturing capability for lithium-ion batteries, uh, the mining capability for all the rare earth minerals that go in the motors, that go in the batteries, etc. What is the best use case? What could we actually do as a society to improve emissions? And this is something that, uh, that intrigued me because when we look at the Nero, for instance, you could buy one Nero and drop your gasoline consumption compared to an ICE Seltos front wheel drive at 31 miles per gallon, you could drop your consumption down to 500 from 536 gallons a year to zero. That's based on my my average commute, 32 miles one way. Or you could take that same number of batteries, you could build six plug-in hybrids, and you could save 2,718 gallons if you could convince six people to stop buying that 31 mile per gallon vehicle, buy a plug-in hybrid, and plug it in every day. You could then save even more though if nobody plugged it in at all, and instead you built 60 hybrid Neros, that would save you 11,820 gallons of gasoline. And the more interesting thing I thought was when we extrapolate this out, we take a look at some relative numbers. For instance, we take a look at Toyota and their volume of hybrids. They could actually be producing an entire 100% hybrid lineup in North America. There are the batteries available for this. In fact, when we take a look at Tesla's production just in the first three quarters of this year, we have finally hit the tipping point where battery production is sufficient to have everything be battery elect or be hybrid rather uh, in the United States. Let's use Toyota as an example here. In the first three quarters of this year, they sold 370,000 hybrids in the U.S. Based on the average driver's habits, according to the EPA, those hybrids alone will save 71 million gallons of gasoline a year. If Toyota became 100% hybrid tomorrow, that would bump up to 1.5 million cars a year that they would sell that would be hybrids, and you'd save 277 million gasoline, uh, gallons of gasoline from being consumed every year. When we take a look at the U.S. industry and we say, what if we were to move that out? Sure, the Tesla lineup saved 222 million gallons of being consumed every year. Just the Tesla sales was seen this quarter. But if every vehicle sold in North America was at least a hybrid with about 20% better fuel economy, that would go up to 3.9 billion gallons. Now, there's a lot to be said for the whole idea of gasoline replacement and Depending on your commuting, let's take the idea of a Ford Escape plug-in hybrid and a Mustang Mach-E. Now, if you're going to be driving less than 35 miles in your commute each day, then there's no functional EV difference between the plug-in hybrid Escape and the fully electric Mustang Mach-E. But here's the real difference. You could equip six of those escapes with their 14.4 kilowatt hour battery using the full size 91 kilowatt hour gross mm -hmm. battery in a Mustang Mach-E. So you could build six complete plug-in hybrid escapes. Now this bears on a lot of things, including the use of resources. We have finite resources. Most of these battery components are extremely mm -hmm. laborious to extract. Many of them come from countries that are not immediately friendly to the United States on a political basis, uh, or are not terribly accessible on a trade basis because they're on the other side of the world. So 
if your usage doesn't require super commuting, the chance is you could probably get by with a plug-in hybrid vehicle and we could make a lot more with them or a lot more of them with the resources we currently have. Yep. I'll also say this, and this is kind of a big thing to think about. There are some decently ranged plug-in hybrid vehicles. Mm -hmm. And while no plug-in hybrid is optimized, they are practical. So with EVs, you have a vehicle, let's take a dedicated platform, something like you know a, a Mustang Mach-E. Dedicated platform, optimized, very efficient. But for those who maybe live in a rural area or a city, impractical, because you're going to need at some point access to charging that you don't have. Yep. And that's where the suboptimal plug-in hybrid, which is hauling around two non-optimized parallel drive systems, it's actually quite practical, even though yes. it's not optimized. Indeed. And the interesting thing, when we look at, for instance, the, the Kia lineup of vehicles, the plug-in hybrid is lighter than the EV. So it's 400 pounds lighter for the plug-in hybrid. Sure, it's 265 pounds heavier than the hybrid model, but the difference actually is closer to the hybrid as far as the curb weight. Um, and the cost is closer as well. The plug-in hybrid's about $4,500 more than the hybrid, but the full EV is another six grand more than the plug-in. So economies, it makes a lot of sense. It's gonna be easier to get people to afford a plug-in hybrid. It's more mainstream available. And we really haven't seen EV pricing drop. In fact, we've been seeing it accelerate because of this demand problem. There was this uh, assumption that batteries would plunge down to cents per kilowatt hour, and that's absolutely not happening. Batteries are going up. And it was a scene just with Ford. Uh, you make a good example with Ford. You know, for every Lightning they build, they could build over 100 regular hybrid escapes. They could build, actually, they could build tons and tons of hybrid F-150s that would save more fuel, really, than the few lightnings that they're going to be able to shift. Um, I've always been intrigued by the hatred of plug-in hybrids, and I think it's because people want to look at their personal consumption. And that's totally logical, right? So I have decided gasoline is evil. I must take my personal gasoline consumption to zero. Anything other than zero is unacceptable. But doing that actually helps further the consumption of gasoline because these scarce resources are being allocated to the wealthy, generally speaking, because those are who's are buying large and expensive EVs, right? And the benefit of gasoline reduction is not raining down to people that make less cash, um, which would happen if we could jam a hybrid system into everything. Take a look at a Prius. It's pretty darn cheap, for instance. It's a decent, affordable vehicle. So it, it is. It strikes me as a crazy thing that 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 the the green movement, shall we say, uh, is really, really, really raining on plug-in hybrids parade. They think that they're the worst of all solutions. You're dragging on things you don't need. Um, you know, you drive to work and the gasoline engine's going to turn on. Well, yeah, but if everybody did this, the gasoline engine would be turning on a whole lot less than if only three percent of people we're doing the zero and zero emissions thing. And it is important to remember that for many people, there will be no functional difference between owning a decently ranged plug-in hybrid and owning a full BEV. And I'm mm -hmm. a great use case example because while I've been in Philadelphia, I have driven my Chevy Volt, which is a 2015, I've driven it 20,000 miles and all but about 2,000 of those miles were on electricity because I go to Costco, I go to work, I've got an office in the center of the city, all of this driving I do is within the original Volt engineer's projection of a 35 mile commute. And so at night, I'm plugging it in with two, three, four, five miles left, but I'm doing full BEV commuting. And if I owned a Tesla or a Lucid or a Rivian, I would be driving to the same places with the same number of electric miles, but I would yep. be hauling along an enormous multi-ton carapace capability yes. that I don't need. Yep. And your batteries would be aging. They're doing nothing for you. The batteries also age differently in a plug-in hybrid, which is the other intriguing thing. You know, the, the gasoline engine being on board is a benefit in this use case because the batteries will last longer. Plug-in hybrids leave a larger cushion of battery for longevity reasons. And because there's another power plant on board, they will move to that other power source 
for preservation of the batteries. If you only have a battery, you don't have this option. Plug-in hybrids, if it's too cold or too hot or too whatever, or you're trying to demand too much power out of the battery, they just turn on the gasoline engine, reduce those demands, those loads on the battery, and then they'll go back to EV mode later. But it, they're not sexy. And I think that is the ultimate problem here. It's not sexy. And I can't pat myself on the back and say, well, I took my emissions down to zero. Yeah. And the other thing, too, that's that's worth mentioning here is that you do have a tremendous amount of flexibility with a plug in hybrid. First, on the battery preservation and maintenance count, there are a lot of 200, 300,000 mile Chevy Volts out there mm -hmm. uh, because they do have that enormous cushion on both ends of the battery, the low end and the high end, as well as the ability to shift over to an internal combustion engine. The batteries last forever. There's at least one guy who's an extreme case. He works at yeah. GM stamping plant. He has a hundred mile commute both ways. He plugs the car in on each end of the commute and he's got 400 hundred thousand miles on the car putting 70 basically 70 electric miles on it every single day and so that's a great example of the longevity you can expect and remember even with something that's up to the minute in terms of technology and battery spec mercedes-benz expects that over 10 years you might see close to one-third battery degradation on your eqs sedan or eqs suv and that is a mm -hmm. huge amount of practical range they will become much less capable even after three four five years on route yes. to that end Indeed. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a serious consideration. Yep. It entails a lot of depreciation on your vehicle. The other thing I would say that's important to remember is that pH EVs have been around a little bit longer than full BEVs. So you have a great pre-owned selection. Look at the Volt. You can pick mm -hmm. one up for 10 grand, 200,000 miles, zero battery degradation, and you can do exactly what I did driving 20,000 miles in mm -hmm. three years hardly ever starting the engine. There are options there on the used car side that are so profoundly unsexy, you almost can't ignore them. Yep. And the used car side is an interesting point here, because if everybody were to buy a brand new EV, that's lovely for the people that buy new cars. And new cars are disproportionately purchased by single family home owning folks. That's just how the used car or the new car market tends to work. Um, but if you are an apartment liver, whatever, an apartment dweller, that sounds wrong somehow, I don't know, uh, not a basement dweller, but an apartment dweller, um, or you live in a house where you cannot change your electrical infrastructure, or like me, where I live out in the country, and it's a really long way to plug something in. That's a very long cord. Um, you know, having an EV can be a pain in the butt. Maybe it's something you just don't want to do. And when you're buying used cars, if all the used cars are this thing that doesn't fit well and only has 70% of its battery left, that is an interesting problem that we have not encountered really yet. But plug-in hybrids, when done properly, would offer the benefit of decent range in EV and not too much of a penalty when you're not operating as an EV. And I think that's the critical part because not all plug-in hybrids are made equal. I was recently driving the Mitsubishi Outlander. If you can't plug it in, don't buy it. Buy a Nissan Rogue. Buy the regular Outlander. They will give you better fuel economy, uh, which was an unexpected thing. Only 26 miles per gallon. But when we take a look at a Prius Prime and a Prius, or a RAV4 Prime and a RAV4, or the Nero and the Nero plug-in hybrid, that's not the case. The mileage penalty is maybe one mile per gallon, and they're all still better than the regular gasoline version any way you slice it. So when done properly, plug-in hybrids with the appropriate battery pack, et cetera, this often means lower range, unfortunately, to some people that really want that range thing. They can be just as efficient as the regular hybrid option and still better than having not hybrided at all. Yeah, and when I moved from Florida to Pennsylvania, my company relocated. I drove the Volt up I-95, 1,100 miles. When I go to visit my parents for holidays, you know, I drive the 200 miles up to New York. There's no issue mm -hmm. there. An engineer would hate the idea of a plug-in hybrid because you've got a marginal gas-powered hybrid carrying extra weight around, and you've got a relatively short-range, non-optimized electrical system. I understand that. It's the practicality that makes mm -hmm. the sense here. As a consumer, I love the PHEV. Um, and it's also important to remember there are some limits to how far you can take this. There are some plug-in hybrid vehicles that give you 9 to 15 miles, which just doesn't really help much. Um, there are some plug-in hybrids mm -hmm. that are just so fantastically expensive, like the Karma GS6 or the Polestar 1, where yep. it's 
you know, it starts to stop making sense. BMW yeah. i8, that sort of thing. There's um, silly, there's silly yeah. plugins, and then there are efficiency focused plugins. And this is, I think, kind of the problem with the the EV movements. And I'm, I'm just going to come out and say it: the EV movements distaste for plugins has resulted in some of the development money for plug-in hybrids chasing range rather than efficiency. When we take a look at a Prius Prime, for instance, the first generation that was publicly available, I cannot say that this was a compromised vehicle. Some people would say that on the EV side, it absolutely was not because it was one of the most efficient vehicles available that ran on electricity. It got efficiency numbers up there with the most efficient Teslas, while simultaneously being the second most efficient thing that ran on gasoline. And we see the same thing in hatchback form with uh, the Kia Nero, for instance. And we're likely going to see the same thing with the upcoming Prius Prime as well. If done properly, these can be ultra efficient on both energy sources. The one tricky bit is the more range you add, the less efficient it ends up being as a hybrid. And unfortunately, your Chevy Volt is one of those examples that that desire to have over 50 miles of range ultimately compromised efficiency on both sides. So the, the Chevy Volt was considerably further down the tree when it came to efficiency as a hybrid or as an electric vehicle. But it's something that GM could have perfected over time. They just chose not to because market demands and shareholder desires wanted them to chase Tesla. And so they just abandoned all their plug-in hybrid development. And it's important to remember that one of the reasons that plug-in hybrids make more sense economically is because it's a lot easier to build a competent plug-in hybrid on an existing internal combustion platform mm -hmm. like the Chevy Cruze, which underpins my Volt, uh, than it is to build a dedicated platform. So, you know, dedicated platforms are expensive to engineer. And as the customer, you're paying for that research and development. Whereas if you can amortize the costs of the tooling of the platform over a couple of hundred thousand or million internal combustion compact cars or midsize sedans or you know, compact crossover utilities, you're going to wind up with a more affordable plug-in hybrid versus, you know, trying to get all of your electric driving yep. done in a pure BEV that has a dedicated platform. Yeah, borderline cases for plug-in hybrids would be, let's be frank, the Stellantis plug-in hybrids, your Jeep 4x E's. Yeah. Uh, fuel economy in real-world driving does tend to be marginally better in them than in the comparable gasoline engine, but it's a very small amount. The big benefit, and there's no no benefit at all in the EPA score, just let's be frank there. It's real world driving where they generally are better. But the big benefit there is I can drive a Wrangler and I can commute with it and severely cut my gasoline usage. The range is not extraordinarily long, but you still have that benefit if you plug it in. And it doesn't hurt too much when you don't. It's kind of the thing. Exactly yeah. how many people plug it in, we really don't know. Uh, I would I would say, though, if you have one and you're not plugging it in, you absolutely should. The benefit is easy to see. Uh, on my daily commute in the Nero plug-in hybrid that we have, 33 miles of electric range, according to the manufacturer. I have a 32-mile one-way commute, but I go up and over a 2,200-foot mountain pass. On the way to the office, I can squeak it in without the engine turning off on just, just barely. Um, on the way home, it does have to turn on in order to climb up the hill because it's consuming more power. But even with that, I would get about 2,500 miles of range out of its nine-gallon gas tank because that's how little fuel it's using on my daily commute. And that's the entire point is it's harm reduction, it's gasoline mitigation, it's not replacement. You're not going cold turkey. Now, I understand that you see a bifurcation between guys who are new car guys and gals and used car guys and girls. But I will say that there are quite a few attractive plug-in hybrid used cars out there. No one is chasing down the volts of the world. They're still very available and very functional. Uh, the Clarity Insight from Honda was actually a pretty good PHEV. Mm -hmm. I, mean, in terms I liked of the Clarity, in, yeah. That was probably the Clarity to own. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a lot of plug-in hybrid cars, like from Volvo, for example, depreciate extraordinarily compared to the equivalent SUVs with the same power plants. And if you're a weird person and you can stomach the oddity of the BMW i3, in terms of the haircut compared to what those costs knew, those are great used car buys that could allow you to do almost all of your driving electric 
assuming you don't have to drive hundreds of miles a day. So there are some very attractive depreciation mm -hmm. prospects out there that allow you to get into this type of vehicle without paying the upfront MSRP, which I understand some people are reluctant to do because there's always that reservation about buying yesterday's technology and what that'll be worth in two, three, four years when you sell. So you can basically let someone else take on that hazard Buy the thing used. Not every plug-in hybrid is the RAV4 Prime with you know a year-long waiting list and a rabid pre-owned market. There are a lot of great PHEVs on the used car yeah. market that are lightly used. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how, for instance, Volvo's plug-in hybrid depreciation curve goes longer term because they are producing more and more and more of these models. Currently in the U.S., interesting twist is that as of the most recent depreciation numbers from early 2022, even the T8 version of the Volvo depreciates slower than the MDX, which I was surprised by, to be honest, and slower than a BMW X5. So they're, yeah. they're about average for that luxury segment, but they're better than some vehicles that we would classy, classically think of as better resale value vehicles. Um, how that will translate out long term, I don't know, because Volvo is now selling about half of their volume in California as plug-in hybrids and nationally about 30%. So we'll know in about four to five years how this, this scheme really plays out. Now, I'll also say this, just to play devil's advocate, there are some contrary arguments here that are sort of big picture things. Uh, I would say that let's just do justice to some of them. There are those who say that jumping full scale into BEVs will have three important effects. One, it will increase the economies of scale on the manufacturing side. A more pull, more demand means more factories, more assembly lines, more workers are hired and trained, which leads to more capacity. They'll argue that with the economies of scale come uh, better efforts to improve extraction, not just overseas where all of these minerals mm -hmm. are currently majority mined, but also domestically and in the West. And it's definitely true that more demand for these battery components will spur more domestic mining, especially mm -hmm. since we now have a tax and incentive structure that heavily incentivizes domestic production of batteries mm -hmm. and the extraction of the minerals. And then finally, they'll say that with greater demand and a jump over the PHEV straight to the BEV, we incentivize the creation of widespread and reliable charging networks, including in urban and rural areas. So those would be the contrary arguments. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that they're contrary, personally. I think that they are complementary because the point is not to not produce EVs. The, the point of this logic is maybe we wait until everything has reached a minimum of step one, then we move to step two, or or we make sure that there are incentives, and frankly, that's what it would take. It would take either requirements or incentives. Requirements or incentives to push the rest of the car lineup in this direction. Otherwise, I do fear that in a rational world, we will hit a particular limit for the number of people that want to buy a full EV, and that we will not have that same environmental impact on the rest of the automotive buying group. Um, if we could, for instance, get pickup truck average fuel economy up to an honest to goodness 26, 27 miles per gallon, that would be a massive impact since Ford sells a million F-series trucks every year. And there are far more pickup trucks sold in the U.S. than the wildest projections for EVs in recent times. And we have the capability to do this now. If we could take the battery and motor tech that we have now, we could make everything in the United States at least a minimal hybrid with a one and a half kilowatt hour battery pack. That would be totally doable. We have the batteries for this. We would also be able to be producing a significant number of plug-in hybrids and maybe a small number of EVs in this rational kumbaya come together world. And the moment that you start deploying plug-in hybrids, they have a plug. There is a need for public charging infrastructure and that deployment. And then maybe there is some time where this builds gradually and you start moving things to the next level. Um, but I do seriously wonder uh, at what point we will not really be able to get every customer to, to want to buy an EV. Then you have to start worrying about penalties and other incentives. So what I'm going to say here is that it's definitely the case that more PHEVs are going to get more people driving electric. But I do think that to make the quantum leap with charging infrastructure, you have to jump, you have to jump straight to BEVs. And the reason for that is that very few plug-in hybrids have DC fast yes. charging mm -hmm. capability. 
They don't create that demand in the market. They're almost exclusively wall chargers or level two. Mm -hmm. There are some oddballs that theoretically have fast charge. But if you want to drive the development of a network that everyone can use for interstate travel, it's got to be a jump to BEVs Indeed. because DC yep. fast charging is exclusive to those. Yes. But that again, very few people actually DC fast charge on a regular basis. So there is this this chicken and egg thing. Um, there logically would be more people that would be DC fast charging on a regular basis if we can push this technology down to people that don't live in single family homes that they own. Um, and I, I have to make that distinction because condo owners, townhome owners, uh, duplex owners, that can be a different level of tricky as far as charging infrastructure. But you know, the single family homeowners, they don't DC fast charge a great deal. It's that next category of shopper, which is not a majority buyer of EVs right now, where this becomes more essential. And so, yeah, you, you do need the volume to help that happen. Um, but I don't know if we actually see even sufficient drive now for that kind of charging infrastructure versus sales. Because when we take a look at Tesla statistics, even they've, they've been pretty open that says high 90 percent, over 95 percent of charging happens at the office or at home. It's actually single digits that happen at D.C. public stations. Yeah, I think with Tesla, what people are looking at isn't so much the ability. They do love the security blanket of knowing they could travel interstate mm -hmm. and do it at a reasonable yep. pace. I think what people really like about superchargers is that they're widely available in sufficient numbers in convenient places, yep. and they're always functional when you get to them. It's a safety blanket charge. thing, yeah. yeah. But then, you know, a lot of a lot of the concern around not buying an EV is the safety blanket. The theory that I I couldn't possibly have an EV because I like to go on a road trip. Newsflash: you can go on a yeah, you can go on a road trip in an EV. You could go on a road trip in a plug-in hybrid. You can road trip both of these things. And yes, you can even road trip a CCS or a Chatmo uh, EV just like you can a Tesla. There will be more bumps in the road. It may not be as perfect as you like, but it is doable. It can be done. But there is that that concern, that need for the safety blanket. And if that's what it gets to get you into a zero emissions vehicle, I'm, I'm fine with the safety blanket. Go buy the Tesla. It's totally fine. So let's talk about some of your favorite plug-in hybrid vehicles right now on the market. If you're buying a PHEV right now, where do you go? This is an interesting question because uh, there are fewer plug-in hybrids than there have been in the past. It's funny that you bring up the Clarity because I loved the Clarity and Honda's two motor hybrid system is perfectly adapted to plug-in drive because the drive motor is really big and it's already there. Stick a batter, bigger battery on it, that's all you need to do. Sadly, Honda doesn't have any plug-in hybrids anymore. Um, so Clarity would have been on my list. Uh, I really, really had hoped that the Accord would get a plug-in hybrid. It, it didn't. So that really leaves us, oddly enough, with the Korean twinsies, Hyundai and Kia, shilling the most hybrids that have plugs and the most available set of them as well. Theoretically, you could buy a RAV4 Prime, which is absolutely fantastic. It is the best RAV4, period. But very unavailable in the United States. Um, the production numbers are very low. Toyota seems somewhat resistant to ramping up production for, uh, honestly, some of the reasons that we're talking about in this video. Um, then we have the Lexus variants of it. Also, I think a great option if you're interested in that. The Jeep plug-in hybrids, I honestly think they're a good idea because if you can get a Jeep Wrangler owner to consume less gasoline, you have won. That is a fantastic thing. Not the best plug-in hybrid ever, but the concept of gasoline reduction, emissions mitigation is totally there. Makes total sense. On the practical front, something like a Prius Prime or a Kia Niro, those would be the best plug-in hybrids, in my opinion, in the United States. The Prius is going to be the faster one, 220 horsepower, pretty decent range in that one, lift back practicality. The Niro looks like a crossover if you want the boxier shape. Um, more practically or pragmatically, I guess you'd say the Ford Escape plug-in is a good option, as is the Sportage and the Tucson, but Hyundai is not selling plug-in hybrids in every state. Kia is the, the twin that is. So uh, you'd better like the, the, the Kia styling if you live in Louisiana or Florida and you want a plug-in hybrid. That's where you'd find it. The Tucson's not going to be available in your area. So now what I recommend to people is... Obviously, the RAV4 Prime is going to be difficult to obtain. It is a rare vehicle. It is in demand. Um, and 
although it is both the longest, uh, the most efficient RAV4 and the fastest RAV4, uh, you can get much of the same benefit in the considerably cheaper and more accessible Ford Escape plug-in hybrid. So with the yep. RAV4, you're going to get performance and 42 miles of all electric range. You are not going to get that performance with the Escape, but you will get a starting price of $28,000 and a more realistic prospect of getting one from a dealer. Indeed. So you will this miss the you will miss the one key thing you will find in everybody else's plug-in hybrid in that segment, though. Oh, what is it like a third row oh, or something? All-wheel drive. Oh, all-wheel drive, right? Yeah. You know, here's the thing, though. A lot of these, I, I thought that that two-wheel drive like crossovers would be a dead end. I was shocked by how popular they turned out to be and how many people in this country have basically just copied over the pickup truck rules where I used to wonder, coming from the Northeast, why anyone mm -hmm. would buy a pickup without four-wheel drive. And then I lived in the Florida Panhandle for four years and I realized almost everyone buys them that way. So it's true the Escape will not have all-wheel drive, mm -hmm. but I'm also surprised by the number of people who will not mind that. Yeah, it's a... It's an irrational thing, but it is it is a limitation for sales, which is an, an interesting twist. There there was a time where Americans were more rational, and below the snow belt, SUVs and trucks were all two wheel drive. You just did not find four wheel drive things down there. And now we live in a world where you cannot sell a Camry in New York without all wheel drive. Like it just does not move off the lot. It's a weird twist, and this is why so many new crossovers are actually giving you all-wheel drive standard in the U.S. It's a weird, weird thing that the uh, the sales rate of all-wheel drive as an option, even below the snow belt, has been been increasing and increasing generation after generation to where now Mazda is going to make every crossover in the U.S. all-wheel drive standard. Kia is making the Seltos all-wheel drive standard, which is a, a mind-blowing thing since that segment is a little little tricky when it comes to all-wheel drive versus front-wheel drive. Generally, the bigger and the more expensive vehicle, the higher the take rate is on all-wheel drive. But even options like HRV, it's you know about 50-50, something like that. So it uh, it is a conundrum, and it's a sales problem for Ford when they're the one that doesn't have it, I think, is more the problem. Everybody else does. They're the one left out you know, uh, without that particular feature. But if you are a rational human being, you will get better fuel economy uh, in the Ford because it, it doesn't have all-wheel drive. Uh, it's going to be less complex as well. And you can always put winter tires on your vehicle. And uh, remember that all-wheel drive does not help you go around a corner any better. It does not help you stop any faster on snow. Um, tires are what help you do both of those things. Yeah. <laughs> Front-wheel drive engine over the driving wheels, snow tires, an amazing amount of mobility. My parents came from a generation where people had rear wheel drive front engine American cars. And up here in the Northeast, they put chains on their tires. You don't have to go that far. You can mm -hmm. put snow tires on your vehicle for five months of the year and be perfectly happy with front wheel drive. But let's say you do want all wheel drive. I'm going to advocate something that's a bit of a dying breed, which is a car. And this will be a nice transition to our next topic. But by the way, guys, if you're intra into plug-in hybrids, you need to look at Volvo up and down the lineup, cars and crossovers, because they mm -hmm. are hugely committed to this in a way almost no one else is. And the ranges are excellent. So I'm looking at the S90 T8 all-wheel drive recharge, which is yep. a rare large car. They're not making many large cars anymore. So this is going to give you 38 miles of electric range, 250 horsepower from the gasoline side of the power plant. You're going to get the all-wheel drive, which is going to give you plenty of mobility no matter where you live, unless you live off-road. Mm -hmm. And you're going to get the security and the road holding, the braking, the cornering, the dynamic superiority of a car. Plus, the current S90 is a very nice vehicle. The only thing I don't love about it is that at least my perception is that this $62,000 starting price car seems to have a bit of a flinty ride. I wish big Volvos rode more comfortably, mm. um, but that's really my only criticism of it. Everything else I like, I just feel like it's not like Tesla Model Y bad, but I don't feel like I'm cosseted the way I am in, say, a Mercedes Benz in the same price range. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I think that some of the pricing for their plug-in hybrids was originally based on the fact that they got a tax credit. Now they don't. Um, but yeah, Volvo is very committed to the plug-in hybrid. That's their 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 step. I mean, 2023, 
everything that you will buy from Volvo in the United States will be at least a mild hybrid. Um, and very shortly, the mild hybrid options will die. And the next generation of the products will only be electrified in some form or another, uh, most likely plug-in hybrids starting and then full EV. So Volvo is on the EV and plug-in hybrid bandwagon for sure. Um, also worth noting, the X5 plug-in hybrid is quite nice, as is the Q5 plug-in hybrids. There are a lot of luxury plug-in hybrids available as well. The Europeans are definitely dedicated to this because European shoppers are more open to plug-in hybrids in general terms uh, than Americans seem to be. Um, so decent number of plug-in hybrid options there as well. Yeah, so... I, my mistake, I, I think I called the S90 a full size. I think by interior volume, it's technically a midsize, but it's a nice segue to our next topic, which is the full size pure BEV comes of age as the 7 Series and in a way the S Class have now gone pure BEV. So, in a world where you can get a Mercedes EQS and a BMW i7, which of these two D segment full electrics do we prefer? Alex? Interesting question there. I like this. I know this is going to be controversial because nobody likes it except me, apparently. I actually like the i7 styling a bit better. And even though it is a a platform that was designed to be electric and gasoline as well, so there are some likely compromises there, it is more attractive to my eye inside and outside than the EQS. The EQS looks very cab forward Chrysler 1990s, um, very 1990s Chrysler concept car come to life. Um, and I don't find that quite as attractive as the look in the i7. <laughs> um, the interior is also not quite my thing. The rear end's a little bit too tight, a little bit too pinched in. Uh, it is more efficient than the BMW though. I think if you're going to be riding in the back seat, this is like a no contest. The EQS has a distinctive sloping roof line that almost limits rear seat headroom to like Mercedes CLS levels. Um, so the BMW is going to be the obvious choice on that basis alone. But here's the other thing. You get the absolutely bonkers 31.3 inch fold down screen, which is a theater mm -hmm. experience. So if you're a backseater, this is going to be the obvious choice. Or if you've got kids, you've got to shut up. That's also a great way to do it. Now, both of these vehicles, oddly enough, wind up being aesthetically challenged in ways that are unrelated <laughs> or the equivalent. The Mercedes is a lightning fast, iron fisted suppository for the road <laughs> with massive power and torque. The BMW is, how to put this, get it in green and it's like the pig from Angry Birds. Um, and that's maybe unkind, but Look, there are ways with the two-tone paint scheme you can order on the new 7 Series that you could actually subdue that look a bit by getting that particular belt line black to match the grill. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. does subdue it and make it a little bit less unattractive. I'm going to come out and say that I'm probably the only person on Earth, based on everyone I've spoken to, everything I've read, I actually like the way the EQS looks. Something about it, to me feels cool and space age. And I don't know, maybe it was me and the guy who designed it and the executive who signed off and we're the three people in the world who think this is cool, but I'm actually attracted to the way it looks. Hmm. So that leaves me with a driver's perspective. Which one do I actually want to be piloting? And this is hmm. where the Mercedes gives you a little bit more choice because right now the BMW is basically coming only one way. You're yes. going to get it as the you know, basically fully loaded all wheel drive, 500 plus horsepower i7 x drive 60, which is nice because you're getting pretty much everything right there. Make no mistake, this is a German car. There are options available, but Mercedes gives you a couple of different steps, uh, starting with a 450, an EQS 450 that is rear wheel drive. And if you're disciplined, can give you over 400 miles of range. Yes. You do not have to get the hyper screen option, but you can step up to the mid level. And there is a 450, which is a four matic all the way at the top of the range, there's an EQS 580. We're not necessarily going to broach the AMG, but it's only when you get to the EQS 580 level that you draw parallel with the BMW in price. So you can get one of these for about 20 grand less than the entry price of the BMW, if you want. If you want. And if you have $100,000, because they all start over $100,000. Um, but I, I, it is, you know, the Mercedes is shockingly efficient and it does go quite far on a battery. So you, you really can get that out of that model. Even the 580 is shockingly efficient, to be honest. Um, so, you know, that's thanks to that suppository like shape. Um, 
I don't think it's ugly. I just don't think it looks quite right somehow. Um, some angles are just a little bit too too future, too 1990s future, I guess, is is the the, the what I'm thinking of. I, I, it, it brings to mind, again, Chrysler Cab Forward, maybe the Bubble Taurus, that kind of era where we thought that everything had to have this single arc. Um, sort of, you know, space, sort of space saucer. You, you put that in profile, float it in the sky, someone would think it was a space saucer. Yeah, it is the one bow design that was beloved of 90s car stylists. And I can easily see a person walking up to it in the dark and trying to, like, open the back door to get into the driver's seat because it looks pretty <laughs> much the same coming and going. Yeah, there's, um, there's a bit of that. There's a bit of that. And I will say this. Uh, in terms of efficiency, we don't know much about the BMW yet, but I've seen some cursory drives that, that have, you know, extrapolated the efficiency they saw in the test that suggest it might be able to get a little bit closer to its WLTP 381 mile rated range than its EPA range of 318 miles. So it might be able to surprise us, but the bottom line is every version of the EQS, including the AMG, goes significantly farther than mm -hmm. rated. And even if you get the AMG, which I think is 277 rated, it goes 290, which might not seem like a huge beat, but you have to remember that most EVs significantly undershoot when they're tested in the real world. So matching or beating EPA is a big deal. And if you if you are that guy yeah. who go with the two-wheel drive crossover, guess what? The two-wheel drive EQS is definitely the one for you. Yep. It's all about that aerodynamic profile in the Mercedes. It's so, so slippery that it, it that the EPA city and highway numbers are actually relatively close together in that one, which is usually the problem with EVs in real world testing. The The highway number is much lower, so that's, that, that tends to be a problem. Yeah, I'm going to be really interested to see how, how that performs when they test it. Um, whether or not that would be a deal breaker, I'm not sure, because, of course, you can always DC fast charge them, and they both charge relatively quickly. Uh, the Mercedes holds a, a very, very good charge curve. It doesn't peak as high as some, but it stays very consistent from 0% from all the way to 100%. So the charge time is relatively reasonable. Yeah, I, I would say it's going to be difficult to tell which one actually charges quicker until we've had a little bit more experience with the BMW. Mm -hmm. On paper, the Mercedes is 200, the BMW is 195. But as we've seen with the Audi e-tron, even a 150 kilowatt hour peak can charge blazingly quick if the car can sustain it. Yes. And that is something that the Mercedes seems to do particularly well, despite the fact that it is a 400 volt system. Uh, hopefully that leads to greater battery longevity. But once again, we mentioned it a little bit earlier in the cast. Mercedes is guaranteeing only 70% of yeah. usable capacity remaining after 10 years. I haven't seen BMW making a comparable claim. Uh, yeah, I mean, that is that's pretty, pretty industry average. That's where most battery warranties are. That's where most most uh, estimates are as far as battery life. Um, usually estimates seem to be a little bit higher than that. Because the warranty is right there, so they want to make sure that everybody, the real curve doesn't hit that warranty point. Um, but that is a valid concern with, with plug-in hybrid vehicles. Or sorry, with, with full EVs, rather. Um, that is a little bit less of a concern with the plug-in hybrid vehicle. And it, it is interesting, like, the, the aero focus that we see in EVs like the EQS is not necessary when we take a look at plug-in hybrids because you have that gasoline source on board. So... Uh, we are finding that as the move towards electrification happens, we get more compromised interior designs than people might be happy with. That tiny back seat in the EQS relative to the i7, uh, not only do we get less headroom, it's not as wide. So the greenhouse area by your head feels very tight, just like it does, uh, honestly, in the Kia EV6. We have the same problem in that vehicle for the exact same reason. Aerodynamics are very important. Now, I think it's also important to remember that there are certain things we know right out of the gate each car does better. The BMW is far superior for driving dynamics. The EQS is an isolation chamber, and it is that by design. It is extremely numb, extremely serene, extremely smooth, and completely disengaged from the process of piloting. The EQS I don't know if I would by, go that far. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I would say I've, I've driven, I haven't driven the BMW yet. Um, I have driven the EQS. It is amazingly soft. It's almost like Mercedes realized mm -hmm. having killed off the traditional large American sedan, it now needs to fill the gap left by the 1977 Cadillac Eldorado Brome. And they've done that really well. Mm -hmm. 
So if you want serenity, yeah, you get I mean it, it is it is the electric S class, and that is the best way to think of both of these. It's the the EQS more than the i7. The EQS is S class reimagined for the 21st century. Uh, the i7 is electric 7 series, and 7 series is not sporty. 7 series has always had a cushy, soft yeah. ride. Um, because it's that's that customer. Bentley cushy, though. It's Bentley yeah. cushy. You can go around a corner. Whereas with the EQS, even the AMG, the, the main difference with the AMG, according to everyone I've spoken to who's actually driven the car, is that it's faster in a straight line and it's got bonkers brakes if you mm -hmm. go for carbon ceramics. But yes. it still feels like an EQS, so you're isolated. Mm -hmm. There are some things the EQS does very nicely, though. It's not going to have the driving dynamics of the BMW. And remember, the BMW is good by big car standards, um, but it's not an M3. But the EQS gives you a lift back and a huge amount of cargo space. Mm -hmm. So you do get something from that bizarre roof line. And then the EQS has best in the industry 10 degree rear wheel counter steer, which means it turns in about 31 feet, which is insane. It for is a very car. nimble. Yes. Oh my gosh. Um, it's five inches shorter than the BMW and it's got that crazy rear wheel steer. I'm not sure if BMW is going to force you to pay for extra rear wheel steer. Um, I don't know where they are on that, but I don't think all out they still have 10 degrees of counter steer. I think it's more like, you know, six, seven, eight with the BMWs at, at the most that they offer. Yeah. Will it be, uh, I don't, are specs completely out on the i7? I forget if we know the turning radius yet. Um, you know, depending on how far the front wheels turn, you can get to the same place as far as the turning circle, even with reduced rear wheel steering. But I, I don't know what their actual numbers end up being. I haven't seen the number. All I know is they have almost exactly the same wheelbase at 126 mm -hmm. inches. It's just the EQS is five inches shorter overall. Right. Um, I guess here's the question. Did BMW pay any penalty for duplicating a platform? Like, it looks at face value like the Mercedes might be a bit more efficient. But is BMW really paying any kind of price in packaging or performance or ultimately range for using the same platform yeah. as the ICE 7 series? That's a good question. There, there most likely is an impact on range because the, the design is less aerodynamic. It is roomier in the back seat. So that's one critical dimension. So the, the greenhouse not being pinched in like a boat tail in the back definitely means that there's going to be an aero penalty. It is certainly not going to be as slippery as the EQS. Uh, there is a bit of an interior packaging penalty as well, just the way that the floor pan has been designed for a gasoline drivetrain to exist in the vehicle. You don't have that flat floor that EV shoppers really love um, because the transmission tunnel has to go somewhere and that somewhere is just empty in the, uh, the electric version. Uh, and then we also have the long hood design, which is very attractive and part of why I like the profile of the i7 a little bit better. But BMW chooses not to put any kind of cargo area up front. And logically, in an EV with a big long hood, that's where the cargo area would go. And this is kind of a weird twist and digression. Digression. I always thought it was interesting that Tesla marketed the front trunk par excellence. Um, when the Model S came out, it was this, oh, it's a dedicated EV platform. That's why it has a front trunk all EVs should have a front trunk because this was designed for the ground up to be this radical EV with whatever. Well, sure, but Tesla also designed it to be beautiful from the ground up. And the S-Class initially got people to turn their heads and go, wow, that is gorgeous. And luxury car shoppers associate this long hood, wheels push to the corners thing, the rear wheel drive proportions as beautiful. Uh, most of us do, really. That is not a great shape for an EV. Why put the sectional profile up front where it is doing nothing for you when a Model S, a Model X, a Model Y, a Model 3, they would all have more cargo room if you took that 10 inches out of the front trunk, shortened the nose by 10 inches, and made the area after the rear doors 10 inches longer, but then you'd have an ugly EV. Yeah, I mean, look, even with the seats up in the EQS, you get 22 feet of cargo space, and the BMW, you get about half that, 11. Yep. Um, so it makes the most of that bizarre uh, backside that it's got. Baby got back and plenty of cargo space because of it. Um, but yeah, once you start pushing the cabin out to the ends, you lose that traditional, let's call it dash to axle ratio. Mm -hmm. The BMW has it, but to no effective end. Right. I will say the one packaging advantage the BMW's got, and it's just down to sharing the G70 platform with the 7 Series, it's got more 
rear seat headroom, particularly in the center, if you are going to be in the back seat. But we already established that the BMW is the back seater's choice. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, I would probably, if I were specking them, I would go with the 584 Matic EQS. I wouldn't step up to the AMG because for me, 516 horsepower and 600 pound feet is enough. Like 3.7, mm -hmm. three seconds to 60, it's exactly the same for me. I'm not going to use either. I want smaller wheels, I want more efficiency, I want the opulence that comes with a softer ride. If I want a performance car, I'm gonna buy something smaller. I'm not even gonna look at a car this size. Uh, with the BMW, I'm interested, in to see, I'm interested in seeing where the efficiency comes out. Because if you get a 584 Matic EQS, you're gonna get somewhere between 350 and 380 rear wheel miles with that car, as long as you don't go gonzo with wheel size. With the BMW, the longest rated range is 318 miles, but only if you go with 19 inch wheels, a spec, I suspect very few people are going to select. Otherwise, it's actually quite a bit underneath 300 miles. Yeah. So for a lot of EV buyers, this is going to be the one and only point of data that they consider. Wheels do have a big impact on highway range, which is something that a lot of shoppers don't consider. Tires also as well. So I don't know if the tires change on their wheel size, uh, when the wheel size changes on the i7 or not yet. Uh, again, some of these details seem to be a little sketchy, but uh, but that's not too surprising. That's definitely something that we've seen with the i4 and the iX, et cetera, that, that the, the schnazzier open wheels, especially the really cool spoked ones, your, your range is definitely going to be impacted out on the highway. Okay, if you've stuck with us this long through a discussion of PE, PHEVs, BEVs, and electric D-segment luxury cars, you're going to want to know where to find more of this. So, Alex, if people want to know more about plug-in hybrids, hybrids, and EVs, where do they go? You can head on over to the EV Buyer's Guide YouTube channel. You can also find us on the Alex on Autos channel. Uh, and you can find us on autobuyersguide.com. And, of course, the Facebooks. Don't forget the Facebooks. That's where we post controversial topics all the time. And then watch the hate mail roll in. Yep. And as he likes to say, all of those social places. Toodaloo. Yes. See you all later. Bye.